that's uh, that's hindering us from just lifting up your name and worshiping you this morning, Lord God. Let us lay it at your lay it aside, Lord God. Lay it at your feet, Lord, and let's open up your open up this service with a with a, with your word, Lord. We love you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
forgetful But you always remind me You're the only one who brings me You're the only one who brings me First, I want to formally thank Bobby O live and in person and as loud as I can with my hand cup in my mouth for letting me use his microphone. He loves me. He does almost as much as he loves Jesus. That's how I know he loved me a lot. <laughs> well, good morning. Hello. Wake up. Etc. Yeah, sing it, man. <laughs> y'all don't know, but um, Pastor Chris might see walk to an Adele song. Y'all don't. Y'all don't see him during office day, but he will. He will. I bet if you ask him real nice and give him some money, he'll do it for you before y'all leave today. Take up a love offering. Yeah, right, right here in this little spot. <laughs> Um, if y'all want to go ahead and flip to Mark 4, uh, we're going to hang out there this morning. Um, we're actually going to, we're going to skip all of the first little bit. We're going to go straight to verse 35. So if you guys just want to pin a, a thumb or a post-it note or a ribbon or whatever it is that you got to mark your spots. Excuse me. I'm going to be in the passion this morning, and y'all are y'all are free to read from whichever one that you are most comfortable with to keep up. Um, yeah, I'm going to come from the passion. So, um, one of the ideas that we've been, uh, which is actually pretty cool to be honest, because I can say we, and I really, I mean me myself just as much as we, because <clears throat> we've done it here, we've done it where where I'm. Planted out at home as far as church goes on Sundays and Wednesdays and my personal studies and the ways that I talk with um, friends of mine and, and, and people that I'm geographically far away from, but we still keep in constant communication. It's really interesting to see if you pay a lot of attention that your kingdom network will normally fit within some type of ripple of the main idea or the main thesis that God has you in in your current moment. So like whatever you're learning personally, what you've got going on in you more times than not, because of course God is union and you surround yourself with people that uh, sometimes unbeknownst to you, they look like you, they talk like you, they sound like you. And no, there's nothing bad about it because what you're really doing is encouraging yourself and in consistency when you keep those type of people around you. But I've got friends that are in the same main theme that I'm in, which is like where the rock dropped in the water, right? That's like ground zero. And then I've got friends that are in the ripples that are created from the rock drop in my life. So I'm, I'm, we're in a spot right now, us here, uh, where we're talking a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of Holy Spirit, the person of Jesus, the function uh, of, of, and the nature, really the function and the nature of Holy Spirit uh, that's displayed through Jesus as the fullness of God in man. That we're kind of hanging out. We've been in that spot for a minute, right? And in the ripples of that is something that we've been talking about literally since I got here almost six years ago. It's the secret place. It's into me. Uh, into me. It's, it, that was awful. It's into me. It is. God's into me. God is into me, bro. Yeah, he's into me. It's the secret place. <laughs> it's intimacy. It's being in communion with the Father on a constant basis. Those are now what, what was the big drop in the water for us and the explosion of the contact. That's a distant ripple for us. Because we've moved deeper than that. You see what I'm saying? So initially, the point of contact, when God was like, hey, we're going to drop this right here in front of you. And it's like, boop. That spot right there in the middle, was that was heavy. We were there for a hot minute. And now we've expanded. We've grown. And all of those things that we learned that were 
foundational building blocks for us now are still the same, but we've gone, I would say higher, but the kingdom is flipped upside down. We've gone deeper. We've gone deeper in the Lord, and those ripples are expanding this way. Not to say that they're going away. They're further from our point of location because while, yes, we need them, while, yes, we operate in them, God's taking us into deeper things, and that large ripple is the evidence of how far we've been in this, how long we've been in this with the Lord. If I, I'm using this metaphor. I don't know why it just hit me, but if I throw a rock, I hit the water, you can see point of contact. The ripples do this, and you can tell about how long ago you threw that rock with how wide those ripples get. So the fact that that giant circle around where we're at is constant connection, constant communion, intimacy, sonship, vertical relationship, that's a pretty big circle in our pond right now because we, we've been there for a long time, but it's foundational to who we are. So we've got to keep that in the, in, uh, not, I'm not saying on the back burner, but in the back of our mind, and it's got to circle back around every so often, right? Paul teaches in Philippians that repetition is good for your maturity. So we spend a lot of time on a lot of things or a lot of time on a few things, but that's good for you. Good, right? Second Timothy's what? All scripture is profitable, right? It's good for, and he lists these things. That's what Paul's talking about. One of the translations for, for scripture there is graphe, which literally just means writings. So while Paul's talking about the collective word of the Lord, he's also talking about his particular writings to Timothy. These things that I write unto you, these are good for you. It's profitable to your person. It's good for correction and reproof and righteousness, doctrine, character. He's trying to write to us, right? And granted, it wasn't to us. It was to Timothy, but it translates to us all these years later. He's still writing things that are pertinent to our walk with the Lord. We still need those things. So for us to say, I read it one time or I've been through the Bible one time in a year and I've got it. Whack. Y'all don't do that. Please don't do that repeat those things what meditation is right pastor chris has talked on that a lot meditation if i'm meditating on the word of the lord day and night that means i'm talking about it in my sleep i'm mulling it over while i'm on the ladder i'm driving down the road and i'm thinking about it i'm quoting it to myself when i'm in the shower i'm talking it to every single person that i can come in contact with because beyond just telling like me and bobby could sit and chop it up all day long and we're mature in the lord uh, uh, to a certain extent, and we're growing still, we're going deeper, but there's things that we both know that we could just talk, and it's conversation. But beyond just having conversation and edifying him, I'm reminding myself of everything that the Lord has brought into me in revelation, and now it's fresh in my brain. So for whatever reason, if we sit and talk an hour today about the glory of the Lord, that's regular talk for somebody in our shoes, but if I go across the street to the gas station, I might have just jobbed myself up heavy to talk to somebody who needs some hope or who needs some love, or who needs some encouragement, and what turned into, or, or excuse me, what came from just a regular everyday conversation turns into a catalyst. Keep those things in your mind constantly. So we're, we're on deep ripple now, right? We're in immediate ripple of, of where we've been in, in the, the function of the fivefold and the roles and the giftings of the Holy Spirit and things of that nature. But the basis of all of that is always going to be the love of God, the vertical relationship that he's established between us that we get to align ourselves with, flow in constantly, and, and by God, remain in. Thank you, Jesus, because I got so tired of dipping in and dipping out and dipping in and dipping back out, knowing that I can stay connected and be attached, right? Like I'm grafted in. He is the vine and I am a branch. I'm not just somebody that's coming in and eating off little bits of fruit. I'm actually producing the fruit now. I don't need other people. You know, not, I'm not let me not say that. I don't need to rely on someone else's fruit to sustain me anymore. I'm a branch myself now. I'm producing fruit. In and uh, 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 I mean, of course, by him, but on my own, I'm producing fruit through being connected to him for other people to do what I was once doing. All those years ago that's the benefit of keeping those things in circulation right i could go into like this whole thing i'm going to try to make it fast but farmers do the, the this thing that i found out about years ago because my granddad does it when they plant they don't use the same space of ground every single year because you'll tap it out they circulate there's a pattern that goes on they'll plant here here and here it'll grow they'll do it for a handful of years be like hey this soil needs to rest Let's do it somewhere else. And eventually they'll get right back around to the same spot. We could do that. We could sit here and teach on the same thing for six years and get tapped out and whatever. That's why the Lord is moving us from glory to glory, from faith to faith. And every so often we'll circle and swing back around to those things that we started on to remind us, one, how we got here in the first place, two, how it's still relevant to what we've been learning in this circle and in this pattern, and three, that you can never have too much of it. You're never going to come across a piece of the word that you're not going to need again at least once in some point of your life. 
it's not going to happen. You can mow through all the prophets and all the judges and all the history and all the psalms and the poetry and the gospels and whatever, and you can really, really get them in you and ride on them for X amount of time. But eventually there's going to come a point or a season or a trial or something that you're going to have to reach back and pull from those things that you thought you were good with and over. The Lord is calling us to keep those things in circulation, in repetition. It's his word. It doesn't stop. It's continually proceeding from his mouth. Sometimes we could ride out a season and it'll be something quick. Sometimes it'll be something super long. But th that's one of the reasons why we try to label the seasons that we're in because it helps us remember where we were at. It's almost like building altars in the Old Testament, right? God makes a move and whomever it is that he's interacting with or interfacing with builds an altar for remembrance so that not only when he comes back through it, but when the people after him come back to it, they can remember what it was was going on in that moment. The Lord did this for us here. We might need that again. Let's take a trip, right? We might need that anointing again. We might need to tap into that same grace that was on us in that season that we need right now in this season. Let's, let's return to that for a minute and just remember how good God was. You can't do that if you're putting things out of your mind instead of continually keeping them in your mind. I don't hear the word and let it pass through one ear and right out the other one just to say that I heard it. I want to lock it up as tight as I can. I want to hide it in my heart because the word hidden in my heart prevents me from what? Sinning against God. If you're in a constant cycle of things where you feel like you're sinning and, and sinning, the more mature you get, sinning moves beyond doing grotesquely bad things. It literally means to miss the mark. That's, it's, an, it's an archery term. It means I got an, a target over there. I've taken the arrow and I've botched it. I missed it. I'm three foot off to the left or I'm low or I'm shooting too high and it's too far away. However you want to fix it up, it's missing the mark. And if we all know, because everybody in here is aware that God has made us the righteousness of God in Christ, then my mark now is not doing good, it's righteousness. That's the thing that I'm aiming for, not in a striving way, not in an achievement way or a medal or a badge. It's who God's made me to be, right? Righteousness is not a title, that, that is being. I, I am not righteous because I wear it like a jacket and it says righteous across the back. My being, my nature, my person, thanks to the work of Jesus on the cross, is righteous. That's who I am. So that, that is our mark now. When I'm shooting and I'm trying to hit the target, I'm not trying to be good. I'm not trying to do right or say the right things or don't look at that or don't watch that. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, bro. That righteousness prevents me from even wanting to do half of that stuff. And anything else that's left in there, that righteousness is going to weed out. The flesh is going to lose, man. You got it. Once, you, once you tap into that knowledge and that revelation, my flesh don't stand a chance against righteousness. It has no chance at all. <clears throat> the purpose of what we want to do in, in all of these classes, the things that we're trying to make sure that we attain is a proper knowledge of who God is and who he says you are. That's our only goal. And it might seem like we spend a lot of time in a certain spot or it might seem like you've heard the same thing over and over again. But I'm telling you, Pat, and they both said it, man. We're going to do it till you get it. We're going to do it till you get it. Once it gets down in you, there's going to be some evidence. You'll know it. We'll know it. Maybe we'll get the chance to move. But until then, we're going to stay where we've been. So we're, <clears throat> we're watching this ripple effect, and we're in a, we're in a place now where God is he's, he's dropping things, uh, and, and there's points of impact, and then there's evidence of those things that have, have been here for a long time um, in, in the way that the ripples are spreading out. So we're going to start, like I said, today in Mark 4, verse 35. I want to talk about a, 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 a word I'm going to— have you guys, um, if I don't learn nothing else today, I want you to learn this one thing. Let's read this first. Uh, this is 35. Jesus has been teaching all day, right? He's been going parable crazy. This is what Mark 4 is about. He's been teaching all day long. Um, the, the previous section in 33 and 34, he's talking about the way that parables were taught and people understood according to their level of understanding. And now this is where they're at. So later that day, after it grew dark, this is the end of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus says to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And after they'd sent the crowd away, they shoved off from shore with him as he'd been teaching from the boat, and there were other boats that sailed with them. And suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, a ferocious tempest arose with violent winds and waves that were crashing into the boat until it was all but swamped. But Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. So they took him awake, or excuse me, shook him awake, saying, Teacher, don't you even care that we're all about to die? And fully awake, he rebuked the storm, and he shouted to the sea, Hush, calm down. And all at once the wind stopped howling and the water became perfectly still. And then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Why are you so afraid? Haven't you learned to trust me yet? 
But they were overwhelmed with fear and awe and said to one another, Who is this man who has such authority that even the wind and the waves obey, uh, obey him? I, I want to spend time on the B clause of that question that Jesus asks. Haven't you learned to trust me yet? Most any other version it says, uh, do, do, do you still not have any faith? Faith is a direct correlation to trust. Uh, so I won't necessarily say they're interchangeable because they're, they're a tad bit different, but you read uh, in, I think it's Romans 4, actually, when they're talking about Abraham. Abraham was, was found to be righteous. It was accounted to him as righteousness because of his belief. Right? We're there, yeah? yeah. There's, there's an interesting part that I like, uh, and, and I've tried my best to stay uh, contextually proper with it across the board when it comes to translations, but there's a, por a portion of that that talks that says that Abraham was accredited to be righteousness because he believed God, right? Sometimes, <clears throat> if we're not careful, we will make believing God and believing in God to be two separate things. Believing in God, more times than not, what I found from, from listening to me and to other people, believing in God is saying, yes, I believe in God, which normally indicates I know that somebody's up there. I've just never seen him before. I know that there's something crazy going on and there's probably some bigger power and everything's going nuts. But my life has been so crap the entire time. I've never really seen the evidence of that. I believe in him, but there's no connectivity. Belief in God means that I, he says things and I take him at his word. There, it's, it's a small communicative difference. It really is. But more time, I'm only speaking from, I'm not saying that that's a, a gospel truth or whatever. I'm talking about from personal experience and interacting with people. More times than not, when they say they believe in God, it's because they want to have a belief in some higher power, but they've never made a connection before. There's, yeah, go ahead. I've heard somebody explain that very close, but it's like, I believe that God can heal Bobby, but I don't really believe he can. Yeah, you know it's that that intimate difference between knowing that there's a real God that does big things and believing He'll do them for me. Yeah, yeah. But did you, did you flip your hand at me? Awesome. I love you. You let me use your microphone. Um, yeah, there there is there's a there's a communicative difference. Believing in God is that's pretty much exactly what it is. I know that there's the guy in the sky. He's high and he's up there. I really do believe he created everything. I believe that maybe at some point he might speak to me and, and, and he might have a plan for me or he might. But if I'm, that's, that's believing in God. If I step from that to believing God, why am I believing God? Because he said something to me. Because he interacted with me. Because he put me on something and there's no way that I'm ever going to think that he was wrong about it. He's shown me his, man, I'm talking, I could go on a list. Goodness, mercy, grace, love, kindness restoration reconciliation and that only comes from meeting him encountering him experiencing him knowing him people believing in god i love them to death and i think they may even still have a real revelation of who he is but they haven't quite got there yet but there's going to come a time where god shows himself to them and it goes from believing in to believing because he gave them a word to believe in he gave them a word to believe so we've got, right, the, the, the Romans 4 is Abraham. What did God tell Abraham? Told him to leave. Told him to leave. What did he do? What did Abraham do? He left, right? What did he tell him later on? What are you going to have? Dude, you're ancient. He is ancient. I'm talking, this joker's old, right? He, right, he's old. No disrespect to his wife. She's old, too. They, you know, whatever. She's not having it. And Abraham's like, hey, man, he said it. Her womb was even dried up. Yeah. No babies yet. Are you proving my point? You can keep no going. Go on, keep going. There's a, see, I, I, I can hear God say that. Other word used, I like using Bobby as an example because God talks to Bobby. I can hear what God said, God said. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dear Jesus. I can hear God say that to Bobby and say, yeah, I, like, I, I believe in God. God talked to Bobby. I believe that. I'll, I'll believe in God because he talked to Bobby. It doesn't seem like Bobby's lying because everything that Bobby is saying that God said to him is happening for Bobby. I believe in Bobby. But that hadn't happened for me yet. I don't have a belief yet. I've got a belief in, right? I'm, I'm believing in God. I understand what's going on. God said that he's going to do A, B, and C, and he sure enough is doing A, B, and C. That just hasn't, that hasn't settled in me quite yet. It's coming, man. It is. I could spend time on that, but I'm trying not to get caught up. Um, 
haven't you learned to trust me yet? One, one of the things, I actually, I brought this in a, in a condensed version to uh, the guys over at Rich yesterday, but it's allowed me to kind of think on it some more. Tr and I, I, want, I focused on this point. I think this is really important. Um, <clears throat> trust is learned. Trust is not a gift like all the other gifts of the Spirit, right? Like we, when, when you go through those things that are produced by the Spirit, trust trust is one of them, but not in the same way that it's a, it's not a, a gift or a fruit. It's something that you've got. You have to learn it, right? It's the question of Jesus. Have you not learned to trust me? Because trust can be taught just like trust can be untaught, right? How many people in here, uh, how many people in here really actually honestly know what betrayal feels like? I'm talking like, Somebody told you that they was going to do something and you swore up and down with your whole being they meant it and then they didn't mean it. Or they did, but it was ulterior. Or they told you too many times that they were going to do something for you. And not I don't just mean a favor. I mean like something that really like marred your soul. Betrayal. That'll break you, man. That'll break you. It, I, it really will. It, it'll it'll break you. And that there's a the, that's almost... <clears throat> well, that's for another time. We'll save that later. Um... It'll mess you up when you thought that you could put your entire, I mean, every ounce and measure of faith that you have as a person. And I'm not talking about salvation wise because we put faith in people all the time and, and it's still healthy faith. You understand what I'm saying? You put every ounce of faith that you have in someone and they just dump on you with it over and over and over. And that, that'll, it'll mess you up, man. It'll bother you. It'll, and it'll leave you marked up in a way that's not healthy for you. And it'll produce cycles and patterns in your life that turn into something that's even worse than just being broken and, and heartbroken and betrayed. And it'll it'll take you deep off in it. It really will. Jesus is, of course, and I don't say this in like the corny whatever way. I mean this in all seriousness. Jesus is the most trustworthy person you will ever meet. He's the most faithful. He's the most frequent. He's the most consistent. He's the closest. There is nothing about him that will ever, ever break your confidence. Ever. If you give it to him, he will hold on to it tight. And he will not let it go. He won't leave it as broken as it was when you handed it off to him. And he won't break it anymore. He's going to make sure that you come out totally different than what it passed through. I'm, I'm, I'll get water worky if I'm not careful. It's funny you mention that. Yeah. <laughs> It's like the plan of the enemy that through our our human relationships that we're, we're betrayed, mm. that kind of leaves this like rough exterior. <clears throat> and then by the time the gospel's presented to us, you're hardened up, bro. We don't. We can't even imagine. Yeah. Someone like mm -mm. That. Mm -mm. It makes it hard. It does. It really does. Um, Jesus, but but in in the sense of of bringing that back, Jesus is about that life. Yeah. That's, I mean, he, he has come to reestablish everything that we really did lose in, in our humanness, right? All of the betrayal, all of the backbiting, all of the, the jealousy, all of the condemnation, all of the things that we, we lost to our humanity. That I'm talking like our flesh just took it and ran with it for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it's still running with it today. He'll flip all that upside down. And he'll show you himself. I mean, he will. It's not, you know, it's not boastful, but he'll show off. He'll come in and be like, hey, you told me that. You remember you told me that? And you're like, I don't even remember you telling me that. And he's like, yeah, I remember that. He's got that on lock. Uh, we're going to use this story to kind of to, to lock that idea down. So let's, let's start back up at 35. So this is later that day. Later that day, after it grew dark, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So where, where we know, because we, we have the the courtesy of being able to read this in its fullness, right? This was happening in real time for, for Jesus and the disciples. So we know in Mark 5, they land on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the area of the Gadarenes, right? We know they encounter the demonic man that's been locked up in the cave, beating himself up, cutting himself, screaming, wailing, getting locked up, breaking out, getting locked up, breaking out. The whole shindig, we know that's going down. The disciples in this moment, in Mark 4 verse 35, have absolutely no idea where they're going. It's one of Jesus' most fun things, right? You know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas is like, Jesus, we do not know the way. We have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so Jesus is like, we're going to go to the other side. And they're like, huh, ah, okay. And they hop in the boat. 
and they get on the way. This is where I want to focus on. They get, let's talk about where they're at in the middle. They get on the boat with Jesus after they've spent an entire day while he's been teaching, preaching, correcting, informing, revealing, etc. Right? He's going through parables. He's talking about the kingdom. He's talking about himself. He's talking about the people of God. <clears throat> they've been with him this entire time. Up until this point, they've probably seen him in miracles, signs, wonders, back talking the Pharisees, and they think it's real cool because they're y'all know the disciples. Y'all y'all have seen Easter plays, right? Everybody's seen those those. I won't say they're very nice and pleasant Easter plays that people put on at church every year for Easter, and it's the same one for the last twenty years. And um, they uh, portray all of the disciples as like these forty year old men. Eh. Wrong. Let's curb something. I'm going to teach you guys something really cool. The disciples were teenagers, bro. Teenagers. Kids. Kids. Peter was the, uh, according to, if, if you're reading deep enough, according to what the gospels say, Peter's the only one even old enough to pay taxes. Right? That story where Jesus tells Peter to go, he's like, hey, go fishing. You're going to catch a fish. You're going to pull two coins out of his mouth. Go pay our taxes. I don't think Jesus would pay for Peter's tax and not everybody else's tax. I, I don't think so. If that's the case, then that means he loves Bobby more than he loves me. <laughs> he'll pay Bobby's tax he won't pay my tax right kids when Paul's writing to Timothy do you know how old Timothy is when Paul makes him the pastor of the church at Ephesus aka the largest church in southern Asia 16 years old and he's pastoring the church that Jesus' mama's going to that's scary dude Jesus' mom right the lady who was like hey they ran out of wine right <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Joe's talking. There's a, I don't know if y'all might have seen that meme where uh, it's Mary and Jesus during bath time and Jesus is up on the water and she's like, get in. And Jesus is sitting there like this and he's standing on top of the tub water. He doesn't want to get in the bath. <clears throat> she's like, hey, they're out of wine. And he's like, hey, woman, it's not my time. <laughs> and she looks and she's like, hey, y'all do whatever he tells you. And Jesus does that thing that we do to our mom. <sighs> Bring me to the, no, him. Just he was probably really eager to do it. There's 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 a, a a cool essence that exists in that, but these, we're talking about these are these are youngins, man. These are young kids. You got to think. You think about history. These are all the kids that didn't get selected by the Pharisees to come and learn the, the priesthood. Mm. Bottom, you, know, you see what I'm saying? It, if if they present themselves at 12 and that's where they're selected to say, hey, you're going to come in with us and you're going to learn all of this Pharisaical. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to talk about it badly right now. We're going to teach you. They're going to present at 12. They've got the entire. Uh, first five books of the Bible at 12 years old, memorized. I have a hard time remembering James, right? And they've got the whole Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy writings because they weren't those things in the beginning. But all of those writings, they've got memorized at 12. 12. And they're reading off parchment. I got an iPhone and I still can't memorize scripture the way that I want to. They present themselves. They come through and the Pharisees are like, yes, 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 nah, probably not. No, nope, no, nope, yes, no. No, no, yes. So all of the ones that they, of course, say yes to, they're going to come with them. The rest of them are going back to work with dad. That's the point, which is crazy because that's where Jesus ends up, working with dad. That's why it's super neat that they end up finding teaching the people that he's teaching. When they, when they leave Jesus at the temple, <laughs> they're like, hey, we left Jesus. They turn back around, and he's teaching the people that just said, no, we're not going to take you and teach you, mm. which is just a wild thought. That's, that's, Y'all can, can have that one for free. These are all people that were not selected to go into any type of further religious learning, further scriptural learning at all. Jesus ends up coming by and he's like, hey, let's ride. They're following him. And now his question to them after the, one of the most crazy things they've probably seen as far as nature is, haven't you learned to trust me yet? Why? Because they've been with him long enough to see him raise the dead. They've been with him long enough to see him put hands on blind eyes and deaf ears, and they come back to seeing and hearing. They've been with him long enough to listen to have the Pharisees try to trap him and him outwit them with the same word they want to trap him with. They've been with him long enough to sit around the campfire and crack jokes and eat fish and have fun and establish relationship and learn about the kingdom and learn about the Father and figure out who they are. They've been with him long enough for that. They're even trusting enough in him to, when he says, let's get in the boat and go, they're in the boat and they're going. If Jesus says, hey, let's get in the boat and go to the other side, he's going to the other side. If Jesus says we are going from point A to point B, you best believe when they ship off, they're going to make it to point B. They're going to make it over there. So the fact that stuff guards, it starts going nuts, the wind and the waves and the, the tempest and every, the boat's trying to sink, and they're freaking out. What's Jesus doing? Resting. 
He's in rest. I want so bad to be to the point that if I see him in rest, I'm in rest too. I want so bad to stop waking Jesus up. I want to quit. I want so bad to stop waking him up. If he says we're moving from A to B, we're moving from A to B. And if he's sleeping, I'm sleeping too. If he's resting and he's taking a nap on a cushion in the stern of the boat, bro, somebody find me another cushion. Somebody find me another cushion. I'm laying down in the stern of the boat, and I'm talking about if he's sleeping like this, I'm sleeping like this. If he's sleeping like this, that's how I'm sleeping too. I'm trying to be just like him. I want to rest in the middle of all that. I want to rest. And we're <clears throat> right now, I can talk, man, you could apply this to so many different ways. How many people right now feel like you're in the middle of a storm trying to get from your point A to your point B? You can be honest. It's okay. We raise hands in here. Be, it's real. It's okay. You're not hurting nobody's feelings. You're not telling me nothing that we probably honestly don't already know. God is trying to take you from faith to faith, from glory to glory, and you yourself in, in righteous manner, you got moves you want to make. You got places you're trying to get. You got stuff you're trying to fix. You got things that you're trying to establish. You got places you want to go, right? People you want to meet, stuff you want to start, ideas that you want to create, all types of different stuff. There's always going to be a point A to a point B going on. If there's not, there's something wrong. You see what I'm saying? Right? How, how does, how, when stuff is trying to flow, how does it die? Somebody knows. Somebody knows. It cannot put it into use. Like the Dead Sea, is that what you're talking about? It stops moving. It stops moving. Yeah. If you're stagnant and you're wondering why half of the stuff that you're looking at has no life in it, it's because there's no movement. We're, we're missing out on this flow, right? And the way that you get, I'm, the way that you push into flow in this way, Bobby's, uh, I'm talking, he's solidified this in me. If I want to flow out, what flow do I need to be in first? I got to be in my inflow, bro. I got to be in my inflow. I've got to have that flow coming from the Lord. And I'm talking the anointing that starts at the head, hits the beard, and ends up all the way down at the end of the garment. Because bro, I, I'm, I'm, I want to bless y'all with this. And I'm serious. This is encouragement. There's going to be times where you're so locked up in the Lord that you know for a fact you're the beard. You're so close to the head that you're soaked in anointing. And you know it. And everybody else around you know it. And then there's also going to be times where you're all the way at the bottom of the hem of the garment, bro. And you feel so distant. You feel so distant, but who cares? You're still in alignment and the anointing is still reaching you, even all the way down there. Whatever it is that you feel like is putting you down there, that's between you and the Lord. And I'm not saying that your position is down there, that anybody is ever going to be the bottom of the garment. I'm not talking about none of that. There's just moments where I know for a fact that I'm so attached to the head, I have no choice but to leak oil <laughs> everywhere. I've been there. Right, I'm trying to get back there right now. Not, not in strife. In Jesus' name, He's gonna, He's, He's reestablishing some things because it's, in, it is in rest. And there, but there's some times when that's where I'm coming from. Sometimes I feel like I'm coming from the, from the Him, the bottom of it, all the way at the end. But I've known the entire time I'm still being touched by that oil. I'm not out of alignment. I might feel like I'm at the bottom of some stuff, right? I might be down in the valley a little bit, but I'm not out of alignment. I still got that oil flowing. And we, you know, there's life kind of moves in those motions. The disciples are in that spot where they, they get that question asked to them. Have you not learned to trust me yet? You've been there. It's, and I'm telling you, man, y'all know that too. It's easy to trust the Lord when you're watching him do stuff that's crazy all the time. It's so simple to say, man, I believe God. When you just watched him pick a dude that's been paralyzed for his entire life up and send him on his way with his mat rolled up. And not only did he heal him from not being able to walk, he told him his sins are forgiven too. <laughs> that's easy. When you just watch Jesus make some weird mud compound and rub it in a dude's eyes and he sees again, that's easy. That's super simple. But when you get to that point where you're in the middle of your point A and your point B and stuff looks like it's about to take you out, are you shaking Jesus awake or are you sleeping in the back of the boat with him? Where are we at, man? I'm, I'm, sometimes I nap, but I take short naps. If I, when I'm in the boat, I'm trying to move from point A to point B. I'm like, yeah, I'm asleep. And then it thunder strikes, my eyes are up like this. <laughs> And I get up and I pace around a little bit. And then I'm like, man, did y'all ever do that thing when you were young where you had a bad dream? You walked into your parents' room and you want to wake them up, but you know that they're like adults with adult problems. And you're like a five-year-old kid who just dreamed about something coming out of your closet that you know is not real. Am I the only one? Did I just admit that in front of everybody with <laughs> for no purpose at all? It happens, man. There, there's going to be instances where we, we want to be asleep like him. I, I want to be resting. That's what I'm saying. And I think everybody just kind of agreed. I want to rest with him like he's resting right now in the middle of my point A and my point B. I want to be there. 
I do. So sometimes I'm hesitant. I'm like, man, I really want to wake Jesus up. But I need to go back to sleep. I need to rest in what he said. What did he say? We're going to the other side. When he says that we're going, I promise you, just like he's promising you, you're going to go. Right? He knew. He knew what the other side was. They didn't look. They're coming from, from where are they at? They're in Capernaum. Mark, yeah, they're in Capernaum, right? Jesus roots his ministry in Capernaum. If you're looking at a map, I'm going to face this way real fast. If you're looking at a map, the Sea of Galilee like this, they go from Capernaum to the Gadarenes, northwest to, to, to southeast. Literally, probably the, 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 yeah, the full stretch. We just talked about this Sunday. Donnie was talking about this. He was teaching on the geography, which is nuts. You go from, from over here in the corner to, to over this way in the other corner. I don't know how long that is. I wish I was a maps expert. I'd tell you if it took them two hours or, or, you know, six hours. I'm not quite sure. Either way, in the middle of it, there's some crazy stuff going on. But Jesus said we're going to the other side. So there's some spots, man, and I know I'm not <clears throat> whatever. I know that there's some people in here that have come from their point A, then they're in the middle of going to their point B, and there's some crazy stuff that has happened that's going on that may happen one time and you feel like you're good and then it happens again. Who knows, right? From, from your point A to your point B, you might come across five or six different storms. But all they are are five or six different chances for him to ask that question, have you learned to trust me yet? Trust is learned, man. He's picked you up already. He's taken you out of one point A to another point B already. Saved your life multiple times. Kept you from doing a bunch of dumb stuff multiple times. Kept your family from going through a bunch of crazy stuff that we might not even know about multiple times. He's proven himself constantly over and over. And I'm sure everybody in here has got stories on deck about stuff that he's done and kept you from and kept you for. And his question is still, while we continue to wake him up, haven't you learned to trust me yet? And he's not disappointed if you haven't. That's not a, a, a rebuking or a condemning or any kind of statement. It's an, yeah, yeah want to be clear do it so we don't miss uh, clear me up misunderstand what Christopher's saying I just me personally Jesus is 100% okay with me chatting with him anytime. all the time he's okay with me waking him up anytime all the time he's just saying there's you could come to me but there's no need to worry mm -mm. right so it's, it's that's where the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes in my life it's like I'm worrying Jesus again. yep you know what I'm saying? Yep, he's not worried. But he's not. He's not upset. He's not mad <clears throat> nope. about that engagement. Nope. He's tickled pink. I'm. I'm Absolutely. You know, I'm engaging yep. him. Period. Yep. But he's like, bro, there's no need to worry. Yeah. I got this. Yep. We got this. Yep. We're gonna. We're in this together. Yep. I got a perfect plan for you. A plan of peace. Yep. Predestined before yep. the foundation yep. of the world. Yep. And, yeah. You know. That's the point. When when Jesus asks those que anytime Jesus is asking a question, it, it may seem like it's got some some negative connotation to it, but more than anything, it's an invitation. And can a prayer of faith and a prayer of worry be the exact same words? Yeah. They can, if I wrote it down on a piece of paper, my prayer, Bobby's prayer, might be the same, but mine is in worry mm -hmm. and his is in faith. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yep. That's what. That's what you're yep. here. Listen, and we'll talk that correlation, right? Right. If any man expects anything from Jesus while he's trying to host doubt and faith, he shouldn't expect anything, right? He's double minded, right? And what is he? He's tossed to and what's the same thing that they're worried about getting tossed around by? You better come on. You better come on. The things that, yeah, go ahead. Mm. For those who come to him must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. See, the father's a rewarder. Not a punisher. And that's why come he on. wants us to believe and receive the word through faith. Because he wants to reward us. He wants us to get together. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, and it pleases him to reward us. Yep. And he is the reward. Yep. Amen? Yep. And so... I was watching this Bill Johnson sermon. He was like, God is not the administrator over this orphanage mm. giving you what you need. Right. Adopting. To get you by. No, he's your father. Yeah. Right? He's your father. And it's just, it's kind of like why we keep circling back here. Right? You, you started with that, this ripple that we keep circling back. And sometimes, like, man, we've already went over this over and over it again. But faith to faith, glory to glory. 
it's good for me to serve Yes, God. it is. I, I need to be reminded who he is. Yes. Yeah, amen. That's the point that I want to leave with, man, because we we're coming up on this last handful of minutes, and I want to give Pastor Chris a second to close if, if, if he needs to. But there, there's, there's the invitation of Jesus to continue to trust. Haven't you learned to trust me yet? The answer, if your answer is no, then his answer is then let's go. It's not chastisement. It's not I'm going to break you over my knee. It's not I'm going to toss you out of the boat because your answer is no. It's constantly, constantly have you learned to trust me? No, Lord, to be honest, I haven't. Come and see. That's the way that he beckons the disciples. Come and see. If you haven't yet, that's fine. When we get to the other side, let me show you something else. When we walk further through this thing, as we continue this ministry with one another, something else. Some, you had enough trust to get with him in the boat, man. You're doing a fantastic job. He loves you so much, and you've come so far. But he wants to take us deeper. There's always another glory. There's always another faith. There's no end to him. He'll show you whatever you've got the capacity to ask for. Have you learned to trust me yet? Yes, a little bit. Yes, I'm here, but I want to do more. No, I haven't. His answer every single time, his response is, let me show you something else. Watch this. Shh. Storm's done. Has that enough? I, I trust you to calm the storm, God, but I still don't know where we're going. Watch this. They land finally. We got you to where you didn't know if you were going to go. Do you still trust me to be who I say? I, I, I trust you, God, that we know we made it through the storm and, and we got through this, but I still don't watch this. What's the next thing he does? Right? He delivers a man from demonic oppression. Jesus, I'm not, I'm not talking about Jesus coming through and proving anything to us. Right, We're not that faithless generation asking for signs just to know that he's a real person. But he will show himself to you in as many activities as it takes for you to trust him. He'll continue to show himself. I am who I say I am. I am the healer. I am the deliverer. I am the one that'll walk with you through all that storm and get you through all that mess. I am the one that'll pick you up when you feel like you're falling in the water and you're drowning. I'm the one that'll be there for you the entire time. He's always, always, always showing himself to us. Not for proof, not because he's got to be like, hey, I'm real, listen and believe me. He's not worried about any of that, but he wants to show himself to you. He wants you to believe him. He wants you to move from believing in him, right? I heard about him. I think he's doing stuff for everybody else, and I'm just kind of waiting my turn. He's asking you, haven't you learned to trust me yet? He's going to establish that belief, right? And in do, I'm going to kind of circle this back. I don't want to spend because I could go another half hour on this part. But yeah, yeah, okay. There, the, when you get to that point where you move from believing in to belief, it was Abraham's belief that was accounted to him as righteousness. When Abraham moved, because y'all know Abraham before he was called to the Lord, he was a pagan, right? Do his, his, his family was a, a, come from a long line of idol makers. He crafted idols for other people outside of, of the alignment with Yahweh God that he comes to, into, into the revelation of. Dude used to make idols. Dude used to worship literally no telling how many other gods. He believed in God. He believed in probably, I would venture to bet, more than a dozen, given the culture and the context back then. But there was a word that came specifically for him. Leave the land of your fathers and go to the place that I'm going to tell you. And Abram, it was Abram yet at first, but it's, we know him talking about it's Abraham. His yes, his belief that he was hearing from God and he did what the first thing it was that was told to him. It was that belief. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. If you're ever insecure in your righteousness, first of all, stop. Pause. There's no insecurity found inside Jesus Christ. You are exactly who you ought to be in the sight of the Lord right now. He has made you into the perfection, into the righteousness of God in Christ by way of the work of Jesus. You are 100%, 100%, 100% whole in the person of Jesus right now. And all those areas that you're thinking about, yeah, well, except for this and yeah, except for that, let that righteousness that you know belongs to you as an inheritance drive out all that other extra stuff. Yeah. One yes to Jesus will do away with your need for a hundred no's to everything else. Let him be who he is and be who he says you are. Move from that. No more believing in him as something separate and distant and, and, and uh, disconnected. Believe him. Learn to trust him. He's going to teach you, right? Is there anybody praying for anything this morning that we need to, to, to lift up or to AJ. mention? Okay. Pray for AJ. Pray for AJ. Okay. Anybody else? Keep my mom lifted up.
today. Yes. I'm in the hospital right now. Okay. So. You got any more word overnight from yesterday? Um, I was over there yesterday. I actually got to go and pray with it. So that was powerful. Yeah, amen. And um, she just, the diagnosis was she had a, a pretty severe infection inside of her intestines. So there, you know, antibiotics and prayer, you know, we believe that it's already done. Amen. Uh, yeah. Amen. Okay. So just, just coming to agree with it. Just a reminder, we got Dan Moeller this weekend. Yes, and, yeah. thank you. If you guys, Friday. If you guys haven't seen Dan Moeller, I really like all our yeah. guys to come. Man, you do not want to miss yeah. Dan Moeller. Yeah, Friday is, is 6.30. That's Todd White's spiritual father. Yeah, Right. Friday night. Okay, and then what's the, remind me of the other two, Saturday is? Saturday morning at 9. 9, and, and then again. We have a, um, there's an outreach at 11. At a, yeah. At 11 down in that same area in North okay. Island. If anybody wants to jump on board with Blake and Ron and all those guys and then come back that night at 6.30. Sunday mornings to be announced. It's probably just going to be their normal Sunday time, probably 10. Okay. I guess. So, but Friday night, 630. You don't want to miss it. Yeah. I promise you. If you need details, get with me. Um, I'll copy and paste. I've been, I sent out the notification to all the lead men to let their teams know. Yeah. And all the transition guys. But if anybody hasn't got in, that information, let me know. I promise you, you don't want to miss it. We got people, leadership from the Center of Hope is coming down. We got uh, a lot of the other recovery ministries in town, Valley Rescue, his place. A lot of these different places are coming out. So, yeah, we're not chasing a man, right? No, but he is. No, he is. And the revelation that he brings, I'm telling you, will lose some stuff in you, man. It will lose some stuff in you. What we've been teaching and preaching, like there's a great anointing that he carries to to bring that message. Yeah, that's what we're going for. Yeah, Amen. Okay, AJ and Pastor Chris, anybody else? The whole Nelson The Nelson fam. Her. Shout out to the Nelsons. Led by spiritual girl Nelson. <laughs> All right. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word and your heart over us, God, that you're, uh, you, you are in such a position to lead us, uh, and, and we are so grateful for it that you have made it uh, to where we have absolutely no interference in connecting with you, that you, you have you have really separated and severed anything that would try to be able to take responsibility for our disadvantage when it comes to being able to hear from you. You have cleared that pathway, and we can align ourselves with you in such a way that we hear from you constantly. And not just constantly, but it's clear. It's concise. We know that it's from you. It's been given by way of your spirit. It's confirmed by way of your word and your character in the person of Jesus. And we know that it is from your heart, your mouth, your throne, and it's for us and for the people that we come in contact with. So we thank you for those words that you're speaking to us right now. God, I pray this morning that you would continue to teach us how to trust you and that we would gear our minds and our hearts towards learning how to do that. That when your question is, haven't you learned to trust me yet, that when our answer is no, we would inflect, we would look inside of ourselves and say, teach me, God, how to trust you better. Show me where you've been, who you say that you are, and, and, and not, prove, not prove yourself to me, but show me who you are. Reveal it to my spirit. Let me see it with my eyes. Let me hear it with my ears to know that it's real. Let me separate any type of doubt or disbelief that's still in my own heart or my own mind. We trust you for your word. You say that you're good, and we believe it. We believe it with our entire being. You say that you're faithful. We believe it. You say that you are just. We believe it. You say that you've made us the righteousness of God in Christ. We believe that this morning, God. We take hold to that revelation and we say it's mine. It's who I, it's not just what I am. It's who you've made me to be. It is who I am. Righteousness is our being this morning. And we say thank you for making that possible. We love you and we thank you for what you've got going on in our hearts. God, I pray that you would seal it. And we lift up these requests from this morning for AJ, for Pastor Chris's mom, for the Nelson family. God, I pray that you would come and you would be everything that they need you to be right now in this moment comfort direction healing guidance peace love uh the the hug of a family member the embrace of someone when they felt like they haven't been embraced in a long time when they just need some contact to remind them that they're alive and that they're still loved and that they still have purpose and value and potential come and be those things to them right now remind them of your goodness remind them of the plan that you've uh, just establish for them and any dreams that they may feel like have died. I pray that you would resurrect those things in their hearts and in their minds right now. And you would give them a fervency to chase after them and to chase after you. We love you so much. I pray that you'd keep us safe. I pray that you'd keep us in wholeness and in hope and in connection with you today. In Jesus name. Amen.
Happy okay. Tuesday, everybody. Great. Hi. Hi. I needed that. Amen. Good work for me. Thank you. Thank you.